All right, let me share my screen here. Here it is. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our organizational grant program application workshop. Um, today we are doing our second to last workshop, um, supporting applicants through the steps to, um, to submit an application for the organizational grant program, OGP is what we call it. Um, so just wanted to uh, thank you for joining us um, and uh, hope this is a um, fruitful, productive session. Um, before we begin, Uh, I did want to pause and acknowledge the first people of this first peoples of this ancestral territory that was seized from them, often violently so. The land that today we call Los Angeles County. With respect to their elders, past and present, we recognize that the Tongva, Tataviam, and Chumash as the original own, uh, stewards of this land, air and water, and support them as they continue to lift up their stories and cultures. Our intent with this statement is to show respect, honor the truth, and encourage more substantive sustained action to, to correct the false narratives and hostile practices that seek to erase indigenous people's histories and cultures. With this statement, we acknowledge that colonization is an ongoing process with native lands still occupied due to deceptive and broken treaties. Our aim is to counter the destructive doctrine of discovery with true stories of the people who are already here and to actively engage in repairing relationships and restorative collaboration with the native communities. In collaboration with the LA City County Native American Indian Commission, we have been engaging since March of this year with local tribal leaders on the development of a countywide land acknowledgement with the intent to also develop toolkits and other resources for county agencies and cultural institutions and to share with our grantees and other municipalities. Um, we'll continue to update you as these become available. So today um, we will be basically sharing tips, uh, giving you an overview of the organizational grant program um, eligibility requirements, pieces that you need to put together to get the application submitted on time. Um, we'll also give you a quick preview of the grant management system so you can see what it looks like, how to get it, how to get your application started. And um, yeah, and then uh, we'll take questions and answer questions as well. This session is going to be followed by group, Q, uh, group, not q &A, a group office hours. It's kind of like a q and A. It's like an ask me anything after this workshop. So that will begin around 2.30. Um, we did extend the time of this workshop uh, because it does um, sometimes happen that we have more questions than we have time for. So in order to kind of um, ensure that everybody gets to hear what they need to hear, we will answer questions um, simple questions about the uh, contents of the presentation during the meeting. And then if there's anything very um, specific about your, or your own organization's practices or situation, we invite you to stay uh, uh, to, for the group office hours afterwards, um, starting at 2.30, so that we can kind of get to know you and, and hear a little bit more about the nuances of your organization in order to answer more like the deeper questions um, that you might have. So Ann Jensen, my colleague, is on the line with us. Um, she is going to be monitoring the chat questions. And so she'll be basically watching to make sure like if there's anything popping up that she that she thinks we should answer, she'll um, let me know. Um, if there's anything that's just a really nuanced question, she may ask you to just go off mute and, and just uh, say your question out loud. So but feel free to chat it into the chat box and she'll be monitoring that. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'll begin with an overview of the organizational grant program in case there's some folks on the line that have never applied to this grant before, or not totally familiar. We know sometimes folks are finding out about this program um, really close to the deadline. So thank you for joining us. Um, the OGP provides two-year grants for projects taking place over a period of two years. These are grants that are meant to 
provide general operating support for organizational capacity. They're meant to boost the organization in a way that's helpful for the overall mission and goals of the organization. So this, what we, this is what we call project-based funding, but the project can really be anything. It's general operating support. Um, so with that in mind, these projects, when you're describing you know, what it is that you'll be requesting funding for, it can really be broad. It can be um, almost anything. Um, and a lot of times what we see is that this grant is being used to support uh, staff salaries. So again, your project can be overarching. It can be whatever the biggest need of the organization is. And we'll go into more details about project categories and things like that, but I, I do wanna go through a quick overview. This grant is a two-year grant. So once you apply, if you receive the funding, you're applying every other year in order to continue to receive funding. And it is, there is a cash match requirement. So you will, for every dollar of the grant that you, uh, grant funding that you apply for, you will need to also have a dollar for dollar match for each of those dollars. And I'll go into that when we get to budgets and things like that. So let's quickly talk through the eligibility requirements. Basically, these uh, the organizations that are eligible for uh, this program are going to be 501c3 organizations or fiscally sponsored organizations with a Model A agreement with their sponsor. The sponsor and or the organization should be located in, sorry, the sponsor should be uh, uh, located in California. If it's a 501c3, offices have to be in LA County. We do review 990 tax forms to see what the main headquarters on the 990 tax forms say. So we will be reviewing, um, doing our due diligence to make sure that um, 501c3s are in LA County. And if it's a fiscally sponsored organization that that fiscal sponsor is in California. Um, the organization should have a primary mission to provide arts programming. 50% or more of the organization's budget should be dedicated to arts programming and activities. There should be a functioning board of directors and at least two years of programming um, completed during the fiscal year 2020 to 2022. So um, just to make sure that everyone understands, you should have two years of programming completed by the time you're applying. And it's okay if you're doing virtual during this time. There are some organizations who may not meet our eligibility requirements. So I'll describe those organizations. Those would be organizations who um, do not have a primary mission to do programming. That maybe their primary mission is to raise funds. We know there's friends of organizations whose primary mission is to raise funds. Those organizations aren't, aren't, would not be eligible for OGP. Um, university, schools, educational institutions, not eligible. Those who are individual artists are not eligible for this grant. Organizations with a city or who are part of a city or county department or agency and their 501c3 partners would not be eligible. Um, if you're using a fiscal sponsor with a Model C or other type of agreement, not Model A, not, not eligible for this grant. If you have a mission to provide social service, religious or welfare programming or services, those organizations are not eligible. You may, however, be eligible for our sister grant, Community Impact Arts Grant. Um, uh, and I, we can give you more details on that. But basically, if your mission is not arts centered or focused, then you may not be eligible for this grant. If you're um, not open to the public year round, also not eligible. And if you're, um, and oh, and we did suspend one of the requirements this year. So um, based on what we were seeing with um, financial information um, over the last year, we did decide to remove the um, the uh, requirement that the budget, that there would be no but a deficit over the last two years. So we did used to have a requirement that the organization could not have a deficit for the last two years of 20% or more. That's currently suspended until fiscal year 25-26. So some of you may be familiar with OGP. And you know, we, we change our guidelines. We uh, update our guidelines every year. So we, um, we like to kind of give you an overview of what those changes are, what updates have been made. So this year, 
you're seeing on the screen here, we've made a couple of changes uh, overall for all applicants, and then one in particular for fiscally sponsored organizations. So um, these, these changes have really been just to provide more clarity to applicants to address the needs of the field at this time. And so I'll just kind of quickly go through this. Um, the three general changes. Um, the first one is that organizations who are providing virtual programming are eligible. So um, the programming must have occurred over the last two most recent consecutive years, but know that um, if you are doing virtual programming, not on site, that's okay, you're still eligible. Organizations who are eligible, uh, organizations are eligible even if they have an accumulated deficit over the last two years of 20% or more. That's the change I was just telling you about that we have um, updated in our guide, current guidelines that may change back um, after fiscal year 25, 26. Um, fi financial paperwork must align with the submitted uh, OGP funder report. And you may not know what the funder report is. I will definitely get into that in just a sec, but know that um, all the financial requirements that you will be submitting, they should all match up. The There should be no more than like a 10% variance between the revenue that you're showing on your 990 and the revenue that you're showing on your OGP funder report. And they should be for the same, they should be showing the same year's information, okay? Um, the last update was that fiscal, fiscal sponsors who will apply on behalf of a project, they have to be located in California. So we will check the 990 tax forms just to make sure that that's the case. So here we'll, we're, we're just providing a quick checklist to kind of give you an at-a-glance view of what the uh, attachments are that you're going to need to attach with your application. Because we know there are application questions, but then there's attachments you have to provide with uh, your application, right? So these are the requirements that we're showing here on the screen. Um, and some of these can take more time than others to put together. So that's why we kind of want to make sure we start here with this stuff so that once you're in the system and applying, you have all of this ready to go on your computer or device. So um, first category is financials. So it's um, basically what we require is that uh, the applicant provide um, financial documentation, um, which encompasses uh, both 990 tax forms, so uh, the, the tax form that the for the most recently completed fiscal year that the organization has, um, as well as an OGP funder report, which is a report that you pull from the SMU Data Arts website. If you're not familiar with SMU Data Arts, we will talk through what that is, but just know you will need to pull a report from a different website to um, add to your application packet. Okay, if your budget is over $2 million, you will also need to submit a financial audit along with those two other pieces. Then we have the cultural equity and inclusion statement policy or plan. So these are board adopted statement policy or plans regarding the cultural equity and inclusion initiative, the alignment with this initiative um, of the organization, as well as the proof that the board members adopted this statement policy or plan. Remember, we're going through all of this in great detail in just a couple seconds, but I wanted to make sure to show you everything at a glance. Um, the artistic samples are the last requirement. This is, you can provide up to two pieces. Um, Normally, we encourage folks to provide video if it's possible, but other but there is guidelines around what you are and aren't able to provide as an artistic sample, depending on your uh, discipline. So just know that you'll need to submit at least one, if not two, uh, pieces of artistic documentation of the work that you all are uh, putting together, producing. And then lastly, we do have a couple of supplemental pieces that you may want to provide. So these are optional. Um, if your organization is providing arts education programming, this may or may not be um, 
an, a requirement. It depends on what kind of arts education you're doing, and we will talk about it, but know that you may need to provide a curriculum sample, learn lesson plans or something of that sort with your application. Um, letters of recommendation, reviews, or marketing materials, those are all optional. You can provide those if you feel that um, you, you would like to, um, but they're not requirements. Um, so yeah, we'll talk through that. Um, so I'll stop here before I get into financial documentation. I did see two things in the chat. Um, it, if you could just talk about the 990N. It was oh, the 990N. We're, we're gonna talk about that. Oh, okay. So that'll be, yeah, that'll be in the next slide. All right, that's it. Awesome. Is that the, is that the only other thing, yeah? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about the financial forms that you'll be submitting. So um, on the screen here, you're seeing a table. This table on the left side is showing you our budget categories. The organizational grant program has four budget categories. Those are buckets that we use to categorize our grantees, our applicants and our grantees. This is all based on budget size and the budget size is from your funder report. So when I say budget size, anytime you hear me say that those two words budget size, I'm talking about the um, budget size and the funder report. And I'll talk about that, but just know, that um, after you've pulled your OGP funder report, you'll need to look at it, find your OGP budget size, and then depending on what that number is, you'll know what budget category you're in um, in the organizational grant program. Um, so for OGP one, these are organizations with a budget from zero to $200,000. We don't have a minimum budget requirement. OGP2 is organizations with a budget between $200,000 and a million dollars. And then OGP3 is organizations with a budget between a million and 15 million. And then OGP4 are any organization with a budget over $15 million. Um, so depending on which budget category you're in, you're gonna have uh, requirements uh, that are, um, aligned with those budget categories. So basically any organization with a budget under $2 million, you'll be providing an OGB funder report and a 990 tax form. If you're fiscally sponsored, you would also provide the um, internal financials of the organization to supplement the 990 of the fiscal sponsor. Organizations with a budget over $3 million, sorry, over $2 million, those should be three organizations. Those organizations provide funder report, Form 990, and a financial audit. So all three of those things are required. Same thing with this one, fiscally sponsored organizations would supplement with some internal financial documents. With this in mind, just remember that these financial documents should be recent, right? They should be giving us a picture of the most recently completed fiscal year. And I know that some folks will not have their most current year taxes completed at this time, right? We, you can go back as far as December, 2020. If you're, if you're running on a calendar year, you can submit um, a January to December set of financials. Um, if you're not running a, on a calendar year, your financial documents must have an end year of 2021 or 2022. And then for those organizations who have small, very small budgets, you may not be providing, you may not be able to uh, provide a 990EZ uh, or 990. You might be providing a postcard and that's okay. If your budget is under $50,000, you're only required to submit a postcard. That's the 990N, and that is acceptable. We, we do allow that. It, you just have to make sure, and this is true in all cases, that all financial requirements are showing the same information and are for the same year. So if you're providing 2021 financials, everything has to end, for, end in 2021. So you're providing a funder report that ends 2021, you're providing a 990 that ends 2021, and you're providing um, a financial audit potentially. And then if you're a fiscally sponsored organization, internal financials for that same year. They all should be consistent. We will be comparing these numbers and the panelists who review these applications will, will be comparing this information. So they'll wanna see consistency and make sure that what they're looking at 
matches up. Any uh, questions about this part, Nan? Um, yes, one of them is so just I think reiterating if 990 if the 990 return is not completed until after the grant deadline, do we then focus on the previous three fiscal years? Um, I'm a little confused by that question. Maybe we can have them unmute themselves. Who, who was it that asked that question now? It's um, I th Jim Kleinman. Uh, it's yeah, he has a few questions. Oh, Jim, do you want to just unmute yourself? Yeah, I was just trying to confirm that since the 990 returns may not be prepared and we usually do our um, SMU funder reports tied to a completed 990 so that the information is finalized. Um, I'm assuming then that you want us to just go back to completed years in which there is a tax return and uh, available data in the SMU to submit. That's right, I, um, that is correct. I will just mention that you can't go back any further than 2020 and, it, and the only time you can use a 2020 set of forms is if you're running on a calendar year. Understood, yep, thank you. No problem. And then also there's a question on the website, it indicates that service orgs, uh, service organizations do not have to be headquartered in Los Angeles. Is that still true? Yeah, that's correct, yes. Art service organizations are the only ones who do not have to be main address location in LA County. Okay, and that's it. Okay, awesome. All right, let's keep moving. So I told you about the, OGP budget categories. Um, so just a little bit more information about that and why we use these categories. Um, so request amounts, the amount of funding you can request, it's all based on your budget size. It's a percentage of that annual budget from the last completed fiscal year. So this is why we use the, the OGP funder report and the 990 and we basically compare those two documents. Um, we review that information to make sure everything's consistent. Um, uh, and but the but the budget categories do not have anything to do with the request amounts. So just know there is a formula for that request amount, but it doesn't matter what, what budget category you're in. It will it will not impact your your um, request amount ultimately. What does matter is the budget size, what number you get on your funder report as the budget size for your organization for that last year that you're reporting on. As you can imagine, most of our organizations, our grantees in this um, program are organizations with a budget under a million dollars. So this is OGP one and two organizations. They make up, a, I think it's 86% or um, something like that approximately of the pool. Um, and in 2020, what we did is what we wanted to basically revisit our, our um, algorithm. The, the, the way that the request amount is set up is it's on, a, it's on a sliding scale. There's a mathematical formula behind it. This was created in 2015. In 2020, we worked with a statistician to update that formula to make sure that small and mid-sized organizations are able to request slightly more than before. So that's a change that you may have seen a slight, but you'll, you may see that um, there was a slight change to the request amount based on that budget size. And so this is basically bringing us to an, into better alignment with our purpose and values with this program, which is to sustain and strengthen small to mid-sized organizations. So with that in mind, you'll, you'll see slightly larger request amounts for those small to mid-sized organizations. And then those budget, those organizations with budgets of $40 million or more are going to see a slight decrease and because they're, they have a cap. There's a cap, right? There used to be a cap of $300,000 for the largest budget organizations. It's been reduced to $250,000. So that's those are the big changes that we've made um, as of 2020. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how our, our budgets kind of align with the way request amounts um, uh, are formulated.
to find out how much you can actually request, you're going to use a grant our grant request calculator. As I was saying, it's an algorithm, right? There's a mathematical formula. We don't make you do the math because it's really complicated. So what we ask you to do is to pop in your OGP budget size into our grant request calculator. This is on our website and it's also on our application so that you have quick access to know how much you can request um, just by popping this information into the calculator. So you would visit our um, this uh, page here uh, that I'm showing you on the screen. You would pop in the amount that it says is your OGP funder, uh, Oh, sorry, OGP budget size on your OGP funder report into this box and then click calculate. Underneath that, you're going to see it says your maximum grant request is, and that's the amount you're eligible for to request for, for two years of funding. So this tool will automatically calculate that request. It'll give you the amount that you're applying for. And then um, you can base your budgets and your narrative on what you're seeing as your maximum grant request. Um, just a reminder that when you're putting your budgets together, I'll use this as an example. If you're saying that your um, request is $40,000, um, this means that the cost of the project is 80,000 because for every dollar of the grant, you're going to have a dollar to match it or maybe more. Um, but you, the minimum requirement is, is, is a dollar, a dollar for dollar match. So just know when you're putting your requests together in your narratives, it's going to be based on a cost of a project that's double or more what the request amount is. And we really encourage folks to um, request 100% of this uh, um, amount because no organization will receive this much funding. Um, we are currently waiting to hear if we're, if we're going to receive a program budget increase, but at the current moment, um, we have a $4.5 million budget. And with that amount of funding each year, we're able to support folks to, to award about 47% of the actual allowable request. So that's why we say just, you know, request the maximum, knowing that you may not receive that much. Any questions in the chat here, Anne? Uh, yes. How does a larger match provide any additional consideration or does a larger match provide any additional consideration for a project? It doesn't really what the panelists are just going to want to see is that it's a that the request is feasible. So they're going to be looking at the budget. They're going to be looking at the narrative. They're going to see if it makes sense. They're going to they're going to try to assess whether or not it's a feasible project. The amount of funding that you have to match um, is not going to be something that they're going to uh, keep in mind when they're calculating their scores. It's it's really more about whether or not it seems feasible and that there is that everything all requirements are met. Okay. And the other question is just about the size of the grant. So I think that's been answered. But if um, if you want to unmute, if that's if you feel like you need more info on that one. Sure, whoever that was that asked that, if you want to unmute, unmute yourself in case there's you wanted to ask a little bit more about that request amount. Oh, that may have been me. This is Jim Enninger with Classical Crossroads. I was just wondering about the uh, amount of the boost that small organizations get. You said it's slight, but do you, can you quantify that? I can't. It's, I'd have to go into the algorithm, into the math, to tell you because there are there there's cuts right so yeah. like once you get to a certain point you get a certain percent and then as you grow you get slightly less and less and less right so the like you're getting like almost a hundred percent yeah the smallest budget organizations are getting a hundred percent of their budget size as their request amount and then as you're growing that number changes so i can't really give you like a Oh, it's it's twenty thousand dollars more or anything. It, okay, you have to like pop it. in your numbers into the request calculator. I'm, I'm pretty good like, at math. I, I think I'll do a graph. <laughs> yeah, you might, yeah, you'll have okay. to. <laughs> so I think that's it. All right, awesome. Okay, so let's see. So um again, I'm going through this because some folks may be brand new to this 
uh, applying to this grant application. So you've never, you may have never seen the funder report before. So I'm showing you on the screen here what a funder report looks like. And as you remember, um, I say this a lot during my um, workshop because it's such an important number. Your budget size on your funder report is gonna is gonna be what dictates your fund your funding request amount. So to see what that number is, it's based on your last fiscal year, whatever the annual budget was, and it's the um, the what that is that number the budget size is um, it's operating revenue minus in kind and ca cash endowment contributions. So that's why we don't use the nine ninety. We don't use the 990 as the revenue as the source for um, that number we use the funder report because there's a math there's a mathematical um, thing that's happening behind that number um, but just know that your 990 total revenue should be pretty close to this budget size on your funder report we're going to make sure that it's within 10 percent um, so you see on your first page when you pull that funder report after you've completed all your cultural data profiles that the first page of the report is going to be have this heading on the right this red number is the budget size and this is going to be your very first step it's going to be the first thing you do before you even open up that application because you won't even know how much to apply for without looking at this so let's quickly discuss what cultural what the cultural data profile is um, SME Data Arts hosts this website. They are our partner. They basically are, um, they manage a bunch of data for us and a bunch of other foundations and other public uh, sector grant makers to basically act as a clearinghouse so that um, we can really go back to them, to this website, to gain access to data on programmatic financial and other information regarding our, our grantees. One of the requirements is that applicants go into this website, it's at www.culturaldata.org, to submit this information. So as a first time applicant, you're going to be submitting three years of data of the, of the most recent data. And then uh, as um, if you receive the grant each year, one of the grant requirements is that you update this website with your most recent data, right? So each year's data you're going to be putting in here. Um, so many foundations and government grant programs require that organizations provide this information through a funder report from the Data Arts website, and this is helpful information um, for any grants that you plan to seek out. Um, it's also helpful just in terms of advocacy and just kind of um, financial management. You can really go in there, you can compare your numbers to others, uh, you can pull trend reports, you can pull analytical reports, so it's a really helpful uh, database and online tool um, for for collecting this information um, and to basically uh, be able to to use it as you need to use it to kind of um, you know make a case for more funding to to support your organization's mission in terms of just like the financial management of what's going on with the organization. Okay, so on the screen here, you're seeing a web page. I've put the web page link here. This is for the calendar for culturaldata.org. This is where you're going to see a list of trainings. They have both recorded and live trainings that you can do to uh, get prepared to submit this. So this may be your first time. It may take you a couple of days. You probably will want to look into one of these trainings um, just to get started. And um, yeah, and they have a really great tech support team. So they really are, they know our grant deadlines. We communicate with them annually and say, hey, our, our grant deadlines are coming up. They know when they are, and they're on the phone ready to support you with any questions um, that you might have as you're putting all of this information together and putting this into the portal. So um, yeah, so give yourself enough time to complete these steps. Um, and then at the end, once you've done all of that, all those cultural data profiles, you have all of this information in there, you'll then be able to download the OGP funder report. Make sure it says OGP funder report at the top. Um, we have had situations where applicants have uh, submitted the wrong report. Um, so you don't want to, you want to make sure you, you avoid that problem because if that happens, your budget size might be wrong, your fund, your funding requests will be wrong, and then your budgets 
will be wrong. So make sure it says OGB funder report at the top and know that Data Arts does not send us this. You'll have to download it from the website and then attach it with your application. We, have, we had a series of online trainings last year in 2021 that we put together um, in partnership with SMU Data Arts. Um, they're really helpful for anyone starting this process as a new applicant or anyone that would like a refresher on both how to input the data, but also how to use it. So this series is meant to be informative for staff who have recently taken on financial management duties for their organization. We hope that these resources will be helpful in your work, not just submitting, not just with submitting grants, but with budgeting and financial management in general. So take advantage of this resource. It's here on the screen. We have all the recordings um, up on the web on this web page that we um, provided last year. And yeah, hopefully everything um, is uh, is not too difficult to, to do. Oh, I also wanted to mention that for organizations who are small budget, the cultural data profile, those questions are minimized so that you're not answering as many questions as like a very large budget organization. They've really tried to ensure that they're responsive to the needs of very small organizations who may be working with volunteers. And um, so, yeah, so you'll see there's a slight difference in the way that you're answering those questions for those very small $50,000 or under budget organizations. So once you're done with that, pulling that funder report, you're gonna attach it here. This is what the page looks like on our application to attach your funder report, attach your, fin your, financial, your other financial requirements, the 990 tax form. And then you can explain anything you may need to explain about your funder report here on this page as well, just to kind of provide some in additional information about any dips or spikes that you want to be um, that you want to address so that panelists understand what the situation was in that particular year and how you've kind of responded to that. So, yeah, so you can you can explain anything you would like to explain here on the funder report in our application and um, yeah so I'll, I'll pause here in case there's any questions about the SMU data arts portion of this application. Just two um, there's a question about SMU, SMU Southern Methodist University correct? Mm -hmm, that's correct. Okay and then um, Margaret has a question that uh, maybe would be helpful if she would unmute. Hi um, uh, as I'm sitting here, I'm getting confused because I think I just did the um, the the um, the funder report um, based on um, the, everything that came through the end of 2021, and our fiscal year ends in August of 22. So I should not have done a 22 2022 funder report yet. Am I correct about that? That's correct. If your 990 is going to be for the 21 and year, ending year 21, then yeah, you'll you'll pull the funder report that ends 21. Okay, the 990 is the one that we just submitted. So yeah, this month. You just submitted it in for yes. the August 22 financials? I believe so. But yes, I think that's probably it. Okay, then if you do, if you do have that 990 that you filed, and it and it's the same, it ends the same year as your funder report, then you're good to go. You should okay. be fine. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to take another look at that and make sure that, that, that the, so the latest data sh that, that's on the funder report mm -hmm. should, should be from last month or from the previous year? It should be, so if your fiscal year ends August 2022. 22, yes. Then your funder report will show everything from last July 21 to August 22. Okay, then I need to submit another another year then to the uh, to the data arts report. I think. I, I think, think so. More... If, yeah, if you're 990, if you're okay. 990 is for that same. Which will make us look better because we had uh, you know uh, like zero uh, earned income during 21. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm I'm encouraging folks like if you can submit your finance your tax form. A little earlier if you have to this year it might be helpful so that you're eligible for more funding yeah well our treasurer was just able to send it in so it, actually they've opened that up so um okay that might change things thank you okay no problem thanks for your question margaret thank you i think that's it 
All right, thanks, Anne. All right, so let's move on. Um, so how are these awards calculated? Um, I was telling you earlier, the budget size is what affects your request amount, right? So it's a percentage of that number. Once we have that request amount, we then multiply that number by whatever your score is from your panel review. So we'll come up with another number, right? That will be the allowable request. And so everyone's allowable request after they've been reviewed will be at everyone's request will be added together. Right now we have a $4.5 million budget that could change, but at the current moment, when we add all those numbers, all that, all the, when we sum that up, we currently don't have a hundred percent of that amount of funding to support everyone at a hundred percent. So what we've been doing is shrinking everyone's award amount down to fit into this $4.5 million budget. So it's looking more like 47, 48% of what you apply for is what you receive. Again, that could change. We are currently waiting on word on whether the OGP program budget will be increased, um, but currently that's that's how we're working. So we're just warning everyone. That's kind of how, um, just to show you like how the numbers calculate out. If your budget was like a $200,000 budget and your request amount was like 43,000, then your score was like a 98, then we would we would multiply that, right? We would get a fundable request of $42,875. And ultimately your reward amount would come out to be approximately $20,000, right? So your request was 42, but your award ends up being about 20,000. That's based on a $4.5 million budget and with a um, number of grantees was 227. So each year we're seeing um, our grantee pools growing. More and more our arts nonprofits are applying for funding. As that number of grantees grows, the program budget has remained the same. So it's kind of uh, stretching that amount of funding out a little bit more, further out. So that's why we're seeing um, kind of a reduced percentage of what we actually see is the award amount um, at the end after um, the scores have happened. Um, so to, yeah, to see the actual, you know, calculator formula, you can actually go to our website and take a look at it. Um, it is an algorithm, but yeah. So, but basically, all you really need to know is like you may you may not receive a hundred percent of your award amount, but you do want to request that much just in case. Okay. So I'll stop here in case there's anything in the chat. A uh, question, will applicants get feedback from reviewers uh, regarding their scores and uh, whatever else? Yes, thank you for asking that. After the, so when we're doing our panel review process, we have a facilitator and a note taker. The note taker is basically um, summarizing what happens in panel review, the conversation and their comments that they will be putting into our panel group, into our um, panel dashboard. So yeah, you're gonna have a set of notes to look back at. Once you receive that score, you'll be able to kind of refer back on the notes on what their assessment of the application was. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's part of our process is part of how we provide technical assistance each year. nothing else okay thanks Anne. so project categories in addition to budget categories we also have project categories these are basically meant to to help the staff understand how this funding is being used it's um it's used for our own analytical purposes but you are required to uh, um, use one only one of the four is um only one of the four on this list you can choose and we know that there may be some uh, projects whose project category could go under more than one of these, but you have, you're required to only choose one. So um, to determine that, I would say, figure out based on your budget, what the organiz organization needs the most. And then based on that, you can frame your story around that and then select the project category last 
after you've figured out what your story is, what you're going to say to the um, in the application about the project, then you can select your project category. The point is that this funding allows organizations to build capacity. So figuring out what will help you do that and choose the category that matches that story is going to be most helpful. So I'll talk through what these categories are all about, just in case um, you're not familiar. So number one, sustainability. I think this is the most popular of the project categories that we have here with OGP. So this is support for existing artistic and or administrative projects that help sustain the mission and goals of the organization. This could be continued compensation and benefits for staff, ongoing costs of production supplies, equipment, or rent, continuing support for marketing, governance, or fund development activities, continuation of artistic programming like payments to artists or production staff, continuing IT efforts, computer upgrades, software, and website improvements. Then we have organizational capacity. These are grants that are meant to, um, uh, that are meant for new projects that increase the organization organizational capacity and infrastructure of the organization. So this is establishment of new administrative positions, significant IT improvements like implementation of accounting, box office or fund development software, development and implementation of new plans or strategies like marketing and public relations research, cultural equity and inclusion initiatives and strategic plan or board development activities. New development activities like the creation of an individual giving program or a development of new earned income strategies like revenue through concessions or rental activities. Then we have artistic capacity, very similar to organizational capacity, but this is for artistic product. So this would be additional salaries, benefits or fees for artistic staff, um, commissions of new work, increased rehearsal time for performing artists, exhibition costs, training opportunities for teaching artists, or new or increased employment for one or more of the positions that uh, impacts the artistic product, like the technical director, costume designer, or lighting designer. And then lastly, we have accessibility. And this is the most broad of, this, of these categories. This is um, support for new or existing projects that provide public access to arts activities and programs. So these are activities that broaden, deepen, or diversify arts participation. They could include things like arts education activities for youth, um, audience development activities for specific segments of the population, like low income communities, people of color, LGBTQ, and, and people with disabilities or other communities who experience barriers to arts participation. A lot of times, so organizations with a budget over $15 million, those OGP4 organizations, can only select accessibility as their project category. Um, so a lot of times we see that this funding is used for like a free museum day. That's an accessibility project or something that happens that's pro providing opportunities for um, segments of the population who normally wouldn't come to an event. These are accessibility um, project projects. Okay, so let's move on to cultural equity and inclusion. So um, you may or may not be familiar with our cultural equity and inclusion uh, requirements of a statement policy or plan with your application. I wanted to give you just a little bit of background as we get into that. So. In 2015, the Board of Supervisors adopted a motion to create a framework for advancing cultural equity amongst the region's arts and culture sector. In 2016, that depart the department, our department, um, began that journey through a public process that included several town halls throughout the county, and as well as stakeholder focus groups, research, and an advisory committee that was put together. In 2017, a report was released that summarized 13 recommendations that rose out of, the pro out of that public process. And those recommendations were subsequently approved by the Board of Supervisors. In 2018, one of those recommendations was implemented by the Grants Division, and that was the requirement to provide a statement policy or plan with your application. In 2019, another one of those recommendations launched the department uh, put together a cultural policy. So in 2020, 
that policy passed as did a motion that put forth uh, put forth by the Board of Supervisors to, to establish an anti-racist policy agenda after the tragic death of George Floyd, which is now the basis for our anti-racism, diversity and inclusion initiative. Uh, today we're in 2022, the board is currently reviewing the cultural policy, the, both the cultural policy strategies and the anti-racism, diversity and inclusion strategies as well. And these are basically building blocks for implementing goals um, and for example, the ones that you're seeing here on the screen. These last two pieces together will provide a foundation for pushing our, our vision even further as we continue to strive and foster diversity, equity, access, and inclusion on all, in all that we do here as a department, as a county agency, and to have a deeper commitment to reversing structural and systemic inequality in LA County. So with that in mind, here I'm on the screen, I'm just showing you basically what the requirements are. And these were implemented in 2018. They are required as part of the application. Um, so applicants must submit one or more of these three documents, as well as proof of the adoption of these documents by their board. So depending on what your budget size is, you can see here on this table, OGP one and two, your Minimum requirement is a statement on cultural equity and inclusion. So uh, that the, the goal here really is to reflect on organizational thinking around how to achieve greater equity, inclusion, and access, not just diversity um, within five key areas um, that the report focuses on. Um, so you're gonna basically, if you haven't started this process, this may, may take a little while. Um, the statement is what's required for OGP one and two. For OGP three and four, it's a policy and a plan. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you kind of get this process started so that um, you are able to get board approval by the time of application. So um, the five key areas that we really want to make sure is, are the focus are um, board of directors, staffing, audience or participants, programming, artists, creators. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more just about what we mean by statement, policy, and plan. Um, and note here, this uh, frequently asked questions on the screen you can use that. There is a lot of information there. There's, I think, I believe a, a, uh, some samples um, that you can kind of review just to see how folks have put these together before. We don't have like a minimum number of characters or minimum number of paragraphs or anything like that. Um, really, we're just depending on the organization to be authentic in their journey and put together something that resonates and is, uh, is uh, a, an acknowledgement of their alignment with this vision, right? So let's talk through this. What is a statement? When we're talking about a statement, we're talking about a brief explanation of why the organization is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, and what that alignment is um, with the overall mission of the organization. When we're talking about a policy, this is an outline of the organization's broader vision for and commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, and how that alignment how that's aligned with the mission, as well as what um, further details, what the organization is doing to realize that statement. And then the plan goes a little further. This is how, how is the organization working towards that, you know, uh, fully complying with that policy? How are they reflecting back on what they've done and how, it, you know, how things are going and how you continue on that journey, right? There is no like, you're not, creating this because you want to just kind of fulfill that requirement for the grant. It's really um, a lot deeper than that. We're hoping that it can really be a way for organizations to have deeper conversations um, and to submit a plan to ensure that that they are really thinking through this information and measuring their success along the way. Oh, and I want to make sure to, to remind you all that not only is, are those documents required, but also the proof that the board adopted them. So this would be like minutes from a board meeting. Maybe it's a resolution, a board resolution where they state like that it was approved. Um, so just know that, that it's, it's a 
two part thing. It's the, it's the document and then the board approval as well. So I'm showing you here a checklist just to see, you know, what, how, like, what is the order of things? You're going to start with um, reviewing that report. You're going to take this back to your board members, have that discussion, and maybe possibly review our toolkit online on our website. Um, and then, you know, put, put these statements, policies, and plans together in order to be able to provide that with your application. We know that there is no one size fits all to this, right? So I just want to make sure that that's clear, that we're not expecting that, that each organization is going to have the right answer. We really are just trying to make sure that um, there is actually a conversation happening at the organization leader leadership level, that um, folks are really thinking through this. And panelists will not see these documents. Staff will look and, and ensure that it's a statement policy or plan and that there's a board approval attached um, but the, the actual panelists will not be able to see these. Um, so just note that. Um, so you do want to make sure you're mentioning your journey or, or, you know, these steps that you've taken in your application as part of your application packet. So, so I'll stop here, Anne, because I know there, there was some activity in the chat in case there's questions. Uh, yes, one of the questions was just about how they would show director approval of the CEI I policy. So it would be a, uh, you could show minutes. So you probably, hopefully your board is meeting and, and taking minutes down. And so they're, they're going to vote on approving this, um, these set of documents. So you're going to document that in your minutes. You could, you could show that as proof of uh, board approval. Other folks have um, done this by uh, creating a board resolution. So a document called a board resolution where they state, you know, when the board met, um, what the result was, and, um, and it's signed by the um, board president and board secretary. So you could provide a board resolution. Um, yeah, so th those, that's like the most, the two most common ways that I've seen this documented. And the other question is just um, whether or not the document has to have been written and uh, written and approved in the past year, or if it can be older. Yeah, we, so we will have some folks who will be using documents that they've already submitted to us, and that is okay. We do allow that. You don't have to have a new version every time you apply. Um, if you are using a, a prior version that you've already submitted in the past, you are going to say that in your application that this is a prior version that you've already submitted this in the past. That way you don't have to reattach it. Um, so you'll just certify that you've submitted this before and then we will refer back to that document from the last application that you submitted. All right, and that's all for now. Okay, so let's move on to artistic documentation. The last big requirement here. So all applicants will need to provide a sample of the quality of their work. Samples should be recent and of high quality and relevant to the project. That said, we know there are some organizations who may or may not have done live onsite programming. So when we say recent, we're being flexible about the definition of the word recent, um, but just know you want to really provide something that is exemplary, that shows the, um, the quality of the work of the organization. It's your chance to show off. So submit two samples. We really encourage you to submit two samples if possible. The requirement is one, but if you can do two, we really encourage you to do that. Um, our, the acceptable artistic samples really depend on your discipline. So you have to look at page 19 of the guidelines and see based on that discipline that you're working under, what you can provide as an artistic sample of the quality of the work. Um, so pay careful attention to the, to the specific re requirement. Do not submit something that you're not allowed to submit as a sample. Um, and also, do not submit promotional or marketing materials as artistic samples. You don't want to do that. Panelists will really be looking for um, 
a really great example of what the work feels, looks like, um, what the audience is like when they're there, when they're engaged in the work. So capture the panelists' attention, engage them in the work early on. They, they may not watch the whole, if it's a video, they may not watch the whole thing. If it's um, music, um, a music sample, they may not listen to the whole thing. So you really wanna make sure you're, you're really showing off early. Um, if you're showing a video, make sure that it doesn't have a bunch of credits at the beginning, that they have to kind of wait through. Um, they're reading a lot of applications. So you really wanna capture their attention. And this is 35, up to 35% of your score will be based on artistic samples and how you're talking about the artistic quality of the organization. So very, this is a very important component of the application. And we do allow hyperlinks. So we know that some folks may be submitting hyperlinks. I do wanna warn you that if you're providing a hyperlink to like just a web page, it's just going to a general web page or website, that could be problematic, right? They may, may or may not know where to click. So you really wanna point them directly to the sample uh, so that they know where to look, what they're looking at. Um, and you wanna like provide a caption if possible um, to describe what they're seeing. So I'll show you a quick sample of, of one of our samples, or one of the artistic samples from last year. Uh, this was submitted by Contratiempo. They're an OGP2 dance organization. They submitted a proposal to support uh, wages of two administrative staff and artists in order to maximize the impact of the programming and sustain the mission. The way that they explain the sample um, is that um, this was a uh, snapshot of Futuro, the Futuro program, and documents the difference it makes in people's lives. It says our community engagement role oversees the implementation of this program. And so they were supporting this person's role at the organization with this sample. So I'm gonna share this with you here. Futuro is about embracing all that is contratiempo, all the different aspects of our work, the, the dance, arts and social action, trust building, what does it mean to work as a community, as a family, as a team, performance, but also about getting to know oneself. I think it's beautiful all the different people that come into this program. Definitely one element of Contratiempo that pops up anywhere we go, whether it's through touring here in our hometown, that human connection, trust and community building, the dance, the joy, the emotion, you know, because it's not always happiness and joy, but really about digging in to oneself. So that is Futura. <laughs> This program has been going on for over a decade, which is incredible, and really has transformed into one of our most powerful programs. For two full weeks, we are dancing, we are moving, we are speaking, we are singing, we are clapping and stomping. Okay. So just wanted to show you a little bit of this sample, right? Panelists may not watch this whole thing, but what I think is really strong about this, and let me stop sharing, is that, um, that they do a really good job of getting your attention right away. Um, you really understood what the power of this programming is. You saw engaged participants in a variety of some of the programming that happens under this Futuro model, right? And then you got to hear from the folks that are putting all of this together. So it, it's a really strong sample in that way that the panelists really got to understand. They saw the narrative of the application come to life in this artistic sample. Let me make sure I'm sharing my screen here. Uh, 
Okay, so I'll, I'll take questions, uh, artistic sample questions, if there's any questions about this here. Anything in the chat, Anne? Hi, actually, I have a question. I uh -huh. came in today. Hi, uh -huh. it may have been answered, but um, you know, the program that we're doing and that we're seeking funding for is an ongoing program that we've been doing at the prison in Lancaster. But all of our work during COVID, unfortunately, was through correspondence. So we do have set artistic samples of the work. Um, one is an audio sample that we did um, created uh, using the work that the men inside had created through correspondence. And the other is a video sample of a piece that was created. The writing was created inside. We have a program for reentry folks and they were the actors. So, but it's not, we don't have like, last year right in the prison because we weren't in the prison and when we are in the prison filming now everyone's wearing masks so yeah what is the rule about how what what would the impact of the samples are beautiful mm -hmm. but they're not last year yeah it's it we're flexible we don't have a rule i mean we do in our i think in our application we say it can't be more than two years old mm -hmm. but we did relax that requirement obviously because not everyone is doing live programming so i think um try to make sure it's within the last two or three years if it's possible okay um, it is that's yeah okay great yeah because i would say like i know last year somebody submitted something that was like six years old and that didn't go well. It was not the panelists really. Um, I don't think they got they scored lower, but it was a topic of conversation of why the need for a six year old sample. Got it. So yeah. So just kind of think through that. Like I think what you're talking about sounds beautiful, and it probably should work just fine. Um, but yeah, I just want to made it, wanted to make sure I kind of uh, explained the recent sample thing. Thank, Thank you, you for asking that. Yeah. So I'll pause in case there's anybody else with any other questions. Okay, so sounds like no. I'm gonna move on to arts education projects. So arts education projects, um, we have like 25% of our grantees are arts education organizations or projects. Um, so when you're applying to OGP, we assess whether or not you are applying under the arts education discipline based on a couple of questions that we ask in the application. So these have to do with whether or not your main pri primary programming is focused on youth or whether or not the um, project is gonna be focused on youth. So there may be organizations who are serving youth, right, as part of their main programming because it's intergenerational but their focus is not specifically youth, it's, it's multi-generational, right? So those are not arts education projects. Um, those would, those might be, you know, we, we would review under like the more broad, like theater um, program or visual arts program. The ones who might be arts education are those who literally they're doing programming for youth five to 18, either in school or out of school, or maybe they're doing community-based programming. So, um, so we do kind of try to delineate and clarify what we mean by arts education by asking a couple of questions. And we do have definitions for these. So in-school programming are services delivered during part of a child's regular school day and are out of the school campus. So this might be in-school experiences, offsite experiences, in partnership with the school, museum tours, artist residencies, field trips or other presentations during the school day. Then we have out of school programming. 
Those are services provided in partnership with a school intended for en enrollees of a respected school, respective school, but not provided during the school day. So those are like after school programs, maybe, you know, weekend programs. Um, and then we have community based programming. And so these are organizations who are serving children and youth and their, or maybe also their families outside of school property and not in partnership with any particular educational institution. So that's just to, to try to like uh, explain that a little bit and help you clarify like what would pertain to your organization. So if you are an arts education organization, you will need to do a couple of things. Um, there is an arts education task in the application where you would provide details about the programming, uh, the program objectives, the youth that you're serving, how your team will fulfill these objectives, um, the qualifications of the team that you're working with, who are your teaching artists, um, how do you select them, how are they trained, um, you may need to provide a curriculum sample. So the, the sample would demonstrate how you meet visual and performing arts content standards or other standards um, that, um, that are relevant. Um, so, and then the other thing is um, you would want to make sure you're looking at the curriculum standards of the state of California if you haven't already. And so we provided a link here so that you can kind of start to take a look and see um, under those standards where you kind of meet those, how you're providing that standard of education to the students that you work with. For community-based programs, you may not be using a VAPA set of standards. It might be more flexible. Maybe it's not sequential learning and that's okay. With community-based programming, you're not required to submit a curriculum sample. Um, you still, though, would need to answer the questions about your arts education uh, program or project in the application. So I'll take a breath here, or let you all take a breath um, before we get into the grant management system. Um, and, and if there's any other questions that I haven't answered, you can feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, Sorry about all the traffic noise. I live close to a very um, traffic -y street. Uh, I've got a question about the, um, so we do it for the prison program. We are doing workshops, which are sequential. Um, they're not VAPA standards, but they are arts, theater, writing, um, movement. And we do have lead sheets and a curriculum for every uh, program is it is there a space even though it's not required for that kind of program is there an opportunity to upload a curriculum sample without it derailing the other samples like you know being like too many samples yeah that's a great question thank you for asking that it's something that i um, encourage folks to use we have in our artistic documentation task on the application, there are, I think, three, two or three spaces to upload additional documents. So you can use one of those for this, for this purpose, for putting in a curriculum sample, even though you may not be required to do so. Um, yeah, so if that's helpful, definitely use that, use, use one of those sp spots to put those in. Thanks. All right, there's no other questions. I'm gonna keep moving here. So <clears throat> once you have all of these documents, everything is ready to go. It's sitting on your computer. You've got it in folders all organized. You've looked at the application questions. Hopefully you've like started your narrative um, answers and you've kind of jotted them down. You can kind of basically, or not kind of, you can now go into the application and start your application. So the URL to get your application started is www.apply-lacdac.smapply.io. It's not on our website. It's a different website. We have a grant portal uh, that's hosted by SurveyMonkey. Um, SurveyMonkey Apply is the product. So you can go in, start your application. So um, when you're doing this, a couple of tips. Um, if you're a returning grantee or yeah, a returning applicant, 
log in with the same credentials so that you can see the history, you can see what you've submitted in the past. If you're a brand new applicant, you'll be registering. So you click the register green button at the top right to start a new account. Only one account per user um, is best practice. So only one account per user. Um, and you are able to collaborate. So you may have like another person that you're working on this application with, they can create their own account. And then we are able to collaborate. We do allow collaboration so that if you start an, if you start an account, you start an application in that using that account, you can invite somebody to work with you on it. So that's the really great thing about this new system is that we do have that kind of flexibility that you can get other folks to work on this with you. Um, that said, whoever submits the application, make sure you jot down your username and password because you'll need it. You'll need it to get back into the system to provide reports. Maybe even you need to correct something in the application. You'll need to go back in and submit that. So you'll want to make sure you have the username and password of um, the person that's submitting the application so that um, if there's anything needed, you can get back in. We do request, or not request, encourage that folks try to submit their application five days prior to the deadline, if that's possible. Uh, we know it, it won't always be possible, but that's um, helpful. Once you get closer and closer to the deadline, the system can be a little glitchy. We don't want you to encounter any weird glitchy stuff. So um, yeah, so if you can start it five days prior, maybe try to finish it prior, five days prior, that's helpful. Um, we encourage you to also use a Word document to keep track of your character counts. Our questions have character limits. So if you can put those answers, those responses into a Word document that just cut and paste those into the document, into the application, that's really helpful. If you encounter any weird issues, you can always um, reach out to us um, at our general email address, grants at arts.lacounty.gov. Um, with any questions, any troubleshooting you might need us to do. Oh, and I also wanted to, to mention that when you start an application, your time zone will be uh, UTC. So when you're working with the UTT, UTC time zone, the deadline is looks wrong. So you're going to want to make sure you update your time zone when you are working on the application. Go, go into your account settings and update those settings to be on the right time zone. <clears throat> okay, so let's say you've, you've done that, you've registered, you've got everything set up. You're going to go into the grant management system, find your um, organizational grant program, find the program uh, application start page, you'll click start. And then once you've started it, um, you don't have to finish it all in one sitting. You can go back. You can save and go back, right? So to save and go back, you would save and continue editing or save. I believe it's, um, yeah, save and exit. You do have the option of save and exit. And then once you want to go back in, you would go back into the system, log in, and click continue to restart the application, to, to continue working on it. This is what the application tasks look like on the dashboard. There's 13 of these. Uh, 3.1 is the one that um, will be invisible when panelists are reviewing these applications. So only staff will be able to see 3.1. Um, so you're gonna start, at, you can start at any point, just know that the budgets, those project expense and pro project revenue and project expenses budgets you can only start those after you've completed the budget and project task two, because those are auto fed. Those, those figures are auto fed by what you're saying is your um, request amount in that second task. So yeah, so you'll, you'll want to make sure those are complete. And then, um, yeah, and then you can kind of go into this as, as, as needed, however you wanna do it. Once you've completed a task, it will show a green kind of completed that it's complete, like a check mark, um, so that um, you know what you have and what you haven't submitted or completed. You can keep track of your progress. There's a little box on the left side that shows um, how much progress you've made. 
Once you've completed all tasks, that submit button will turn green. And then you can, com you can complete the submission. Okay. I'll, before I go into the narrative, um, just making sure I answer any questions that might've popped up. I've got one. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> So I was an art theater workers project was an arts partner a number of times with friends outside in Los Angeles County. Every time I tried to fill in my current and we never applied for this grant, but we, we had a CIAG grant. Every time I try to fill in the first page with the organizational information, it keeps defaulting back to friends outside information. Okay, so uh, that is a special case. So, okay, yeah, let me clarify. So if you're applying to CAAG, you're not eligible for OGP and vice versa. Okay. I'm not, it just keeps defaulting back to that. That is because when you set up your profile, you set it up with the main applicant being friends outside. So how do I change my profile? Because I went into the profile and it doesn't look like there's much information we, put in. We what, what do I do to wipe Let's connect, let's connect at office hours. I, I am coming to office hours. Okay, okay, great, let's do that. Yeah, that way we can okay. keep it moving because it's, it's almost 2.30. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions, Gen just general questions? Yes. Um, my question, hi, might be related, uh, but not quite. Um, uh, our The email address uh, that is attached to the account mm -hmm. is from our uh, managing director from like two years ago. We didn't apply last year. So how do I, is there a way to go into the system and change the profile so that emails or whatever are not, that it's not tied to that person's email account? Yes, um, grants at arts.lacounty.gov, send us an email. We can switch the user that's associated with that. Grants.lacounty.gov. Grants at arts.lacounty.gov. And I'll, show it, I'll, I'll show it on the screen on the last page. In a, in okay, just a thank you. It's in the chat as well. I just put it in. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. All right, any other general questions? Okay, let's keep moving. So the narrative questions, quick tips. These are really just kind of best practices for when you're grant writing. You're copying, pasting, hope, hopefully from a Word document. You're starting this early. Um, Word documents will help you keep track of those character, um, character counts. We do have limitations on those. So make sure that you are abiding by those character limits so that you're not caught up with like a paragraph being cut up cut in the middle and you're not able to um, fully express what you need to express in that box. So yeah, so do, so try to start with a Word document. You're gonna wanna highlight your organization's goals, how your pro programming is unique, um, who you want, who you serve currently, who you want to serve through your programs, um, and then um, how you've addressed challenges. So um, you may have staff and leadership that are trained and qualified to lead this project. Talk about them, talk about who's involved, be very transparent as much as possible. Um, try to over avoid hyperbole, really just stick to the goals of the organization, the goals of the project and how they're tied back to those long-term goals. Take your time to craft a project narrative that really details how you'll use the funding, who it will serve, and how you'll evaluate the achievements of the project you produce. Um, additionally, you, we have some new questions, so you're gonna wanna touch on just in terms of cultural equity and inclusion, what your internal and external strategies and activities are uh, on, uh, in alignment with that vision and those values. try to avoid using too much marketing information. So it's okay to like talk about like the season's programs, but you don't want it to just be like a commercial where you're just saying how amazing you are. Like you really wanna talk about the actual like organizational goals um, and who's involved, um, how you're putting this together. Um, keep in mind that panelists may or may not be familiar with the work. So you really wanna help them understand who you are, why you do what you do and how you do it. 
bullet points are great. Outline format is great. Uh, we encourage you to use that. Try to make sure you're connecting the dots for that for that reader. And if you can have somebody read it before you submit it, uh, that's a good practice as well because they can give you kind of a more objective look um, and 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 let you know if there's any grammatical errors or any dates that were incorrect or like not not something doesn't look quite right. You you do want to see if you can get an outside reader to to take a quick look at it before you submit that. Consistency and clarity is key. So when you're putting these together, this is the organ. So you're going to put two things together: the organizational narrative and then the project narrative. Some folks will not be creating a project narrative. The reason is that uh, in 2021 we updated our guidelines so that those who are OGP one organizations who are submitting a sustainability project um, only have to submit an organizational narrative and then talk a little bit about the evaluation component. Um, and the reason is that a lot of times these sustainability projects might be something that's ongoing that you've been doing for many years and your project is really what you've been doing ongoing. So you can use your organizational narrative to give those details on what you'll be doing over the next two years. Um, so yeah, and so when you're putting the organizational narrative together, you're putting together information about um, the mission, the history and programming of the organization, you're going to talk about your leadership, the values of the organization, how you make artistic decisions. This is where you kind of get into the details of the story of the organization, the evolution. Um, and you want to make sure that each answer um, really addresses the prompt questions. We do have prompt questions that are meant to kind of guide you through this. So yeah, try to make sure you're, you're addressing those questions. Um, and then And then we do have a, oh, sorry, I was going to say we have a sample application. So our sample application is online. I'll put a link to it in the chat at the end, but just know that you have the ability to look at the sample application before you go into this to, to look at what those narrative questions are. When you're putting together the organizational narrative, you'll also be talking about your audience. So do your best to paint the picture of who's coming to your events, how you're serving those folks. No one is, is serving every person in that county. So who are the folks that are coming to your shows? If you can use survey data, census data, anything that you can get your hands on to put this together to be really specific about geography, demographics, economic characteristics, cultural characteristics, um, anything that will help the panelists to understand how you put your programs together, who participates and why. And then again here, you're talking about external strategies around cultural equity and inclusion. What are you doing in terms of programming, audiences, community engagement, or other strategies? Um, so you're providing details here regarding the last two or more years of your programming. Okay, so I'll pause. Anything in the chat, Anne? No, nothing new in the chat. Okay, great. Um, let's talk about budgets. I know we're running into running out of time. Just a quick overview of the budgets. The project income is where you're going to say how you're going to match each dollar of the grant. So you don't have to do it line by line. All you have to say is the amount. What is the amount, the full amount that you'll be using to match each dollar of the grant? It might not be a dollar for, it might be more than a dollar for dollar grant. That's fine. Just um, give us what that amount is here. There is um, validation so that if it's if that second box is under is like less than the box above it, it will not let you submit it because it'll be wrong because it has to be a dollar for dollar match or more. So yeah, so you're you're putting that amount in on the first page and then on the second uh, box, you're putting in um, any explanation that you want to provide regarding your sources of income. These don't have to be new sources of income. They can be ongoing sources. Maybe you're getting a grant every year from the city or you're getting, um, you're using ticket revenue or board donations or something. You can use board contributions. You can use like anything that's like earned or contributed revenue is allowed. Um, so just figure out how you're going to match it up and then put that information here in this box. 
And then the expenses budget is slightly more complicated because you're actually giving information on how you're going to spend the funds. Um, so you're putting information both about how you're going to spend the project, uh, the funding request funds, and then the matching funds. And so um, as long as those two total out to be equal or the matching is more, you should be good. There is also validation on these tables to make sure the math is right. Um, and then you have the space to also um, explain anything you might want to explain if you're, you know, if you're paying for artist fees or staff staffing, things like that, you may want to give a little bit more explanation explanation about how you're putting those numbers together. So you'll have the space to do that. We do re use a review criteria every year. Um, the score can be up to 100 points. And then every, um, ev there's five criteria and then every panelist will give a number under each of the review criteria and then we'll average out everyone's totals. Um, so we recommend that you download and read through the guidelines. Page 19 in particular has the review criteria definitions. This is how we ask uh, our panelists to review this information. Each piece of the application will align with one of these review criteria. Um, and so want to make sure that you kind of take a look at that when you're looking at the application questions. If you see a parenthesis with a criterion, that's telling you what review criteria aligns with it. Um, so connect the dots for those panelists. Make sure they aren't left wondering or unclear about something in the application. Be really um, uh, clear and concise so that they can give you the maximum number of points that they can in each of these in each of these categories and note that um, for criterion two and five this is where they're giving you an assessment around your cultural equity and inclusion um, information so this is under organizational readiness and then also under awareness of and response to community needs so pro tip take a look at the guidelines make sure that you Thoroughly look through those. A lot of everything that I just went through today is there in those guidelines um, and the sample application as well as actually here at this. All of that is here at this link, www.lacountyarts.org slash how to apply to OGP. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll cut and paste this into the chat and you'll have those resources to start to kind of review that. We have updated our, updated our deadline, so know that our um, application deadline was October 5th. We've up, updated it. It's now October 11th, so you have a couple more days. Yay! 11.59 um, p.m. PST uh, is when we will be closing it out. And after that time, we will not give more extensions, so just know it should be in by that time, no later than then. Um, and we're available for questions. Um, we are starting our office hours officially now, but just wanted to make sure that you know that um, the application deadline has been updated. And also I talked about this earlier, but all of our applications are reviewed by panelists that are peers. So these are artists, arts, arts professionals, community members, cultural workers who are working in the field specifically with knowledge of the LA region art sector. So whether you do or do not receive the funding, which approximately 90% of folks who apply receive it, you will get panel feedback regarding um, the, the application that you submit. So we'll, we'll provide those notes as part of the feedback. Okay, so if there's any other questions here, we now have the time to do it. If, you're, um, if you've got all your questions answered, feel free to log out. Thank you for joining us. Good luck with your application. And thank you, Anne, for monitoring the chat. Sure, there is one other question in the chat that just came in about, no, I can't see it. Ah, it went away. It was from Jim about um, matching funds. Jim, oh, oh, go ahead. Hi, uh, I, I asked if uh, we can use for matching funds uh, contributions that we use to match another grant. In other words, use the same contributions to match the county grant as we use to match a state grant. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that should be fine. I mean, I think you're probably using the state grant to match the county grant, right? Potentially. 
Oh yeah, that's the other question. Uh, would would a, a contribution from another grant count to uh, yes. match? It does. Yeah, absolutely. You can use another grant to match it. And we're not going to okay. come back to you and say, you know, this might be projected. You might be projecting that you'll receive the grant. You don't have it secured. That's okay. Yeah. You can include it as part of your application. But uh, our, all, almost all our funding comes from individual contributors. That's so fine. Could we, and, and so we could use individual contributors to uh, the same contribution to match both a county grant and a state grant. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, I think okay. so. As long as it's you're, you're, you're basically it's the same objectives, it sounds like. So yeah, if yeah. that's the case, that's totally fine. All right, any other questions? I'll stop sharing and I'm gonna stop the video. Thank you, everyone.